Well, good morning, Walden Church. Today is our last Sunday in a series called Church Where You Live. I wanted to take a couple weeks this summer to talk about church and why we come to church, what we do here. Uh, and and I, just, I just fear that sometimes we end up doing some things in life because, you know, they're habit or because we've always done it. And I thought, let's just examine this and just kind of come back, right? Come back to what we're, we're supposed to be doing. Uh, the first week we were together, we talked about our strategy and we said that, you know, one of the first things that we want to do as a church is love God, love others. Last week, we said our uh, primary purpose here on earth is to make more Christians and better Christians. And today, I kind of want to have that locker room huddle that every team needs to have. You know, last week we talked about dressing up for church and how that got started and probably rethink about, you know, what, what appearance maybe we're projecting when we come to church. That we don't need to, we don't need to wear nice clothes. That's not, the, that's not the thing that God's looking for. But in thinking about that, I was thinking about today and, and, and how we would kind of bridge the gap between these two lessons. And really, when we come into, into a church building and we think about what we would wear, it would probably be more appropriate if we all wore a, a team jersey that would kind of communicate that we were all on the same team, that we were a collective. This right here, this is the refueling station. This is the place where we get motivated. This is the locker room huddle. This is where we get, where we get encouraged. A any you know, players that have gotten beat up or banged up during the week, this is where they get bandaged. This is where the coach inspires us to get back out there. And the reality is, you know, in a sports game, the players don't want to be in the locker room and they don't want to be on the bench. They want to be out there in the game. They want to play. They want to make a difference. So my hope is that's what we want. The Apostle Paul has written a lot of things. He was also a church planter. He was also a disciple. He was probably the very first prolific Christian author. Many of his writings were letters to churches. And much of what we teach about church and how we do church comes from his writings. So I wanted to read to you one of his letters. This is a, a letter to the church he wrote uh, to in Colossae. He starts off, Paul, an apostle, apostle just means someone who is sent, of Jesus Christ by the will of God. So Paul begins his letter by the will of God. In other words, what I'm going to communicate with you now is God's desire, what God wants. Why did Paul become an apostle? Because God wanted him to. Everything that happened to Paul in his life happened for a reason. And the reason was that it was something that God wanted. In verse 9, he says, For this reason, since the day we heard about you, that would be the church, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. So the next thing Paul says is, I have been praying for this church so that you will also have a knowledge of God's will. Your wants your will, your purpose as a church, should be the same thing as God's. His will is your will. Paul says, I'm living in the will of God, and I'm praying that your church is living in the will of God too. And that's a good place to start, right? And, and a good place to focus inward and ask that same question of us. Are we praying that same prayer for our church? Not for our lives, but for the church. When we huddle up like this, when we go through the playbook, and we're trying to find strategy, and we're, we're looking at the chalkboard. Are we asking, what is God's plan? Paul says, Lord, help them understand your will. Help them understand what you want. Help them to know and do your will. You know, lately, we, we all know that our lives, as, as COVID has come to an end and it's, it's finishing up in a couple of places, we start getting pulled. Our lives get, start getting pulled in a whole bunch of different directions. There's so many voices and there's so many opportunities that kind of take us this way or that. And really, church life isn't any different. Churches are flooded 
with opportunities. There's email, there's phone calls, there's flyers, there's visits from people, and they would say, hey, we, we would love your church to do this, or we would love your church to do that. And people call the church and they say, hey, we, we want your church to give towards this, or we want your church to be involved in that. And so you have to field all of that information coming in and discern, okay, what, what's the right voice to listen to? And of course, the best answer is, well, the voice you need to listen to is God's, right? We have to do God's will. We have to seek God's will for his church. And, you know, that seems like the best answer. It's also the generic answer, right? But when you use that as your answer, well, then that changes the question. Does the church want to know what God's will is? Because let's face it, once you know what God's will is, once you receive your marching orders, then you have to do it, right? And is that what you really want? Or is, or is it just easier as a church to say, I don't know what God wants, and then just do it your own way? Well, I hope that you're like me, and I hope that you want to know. Otherwise, what are we doing here, right? If we're just going through the motions as a church, then really this is all just a waste of time. And you're missing out on enjoying your beautiful weekend. I want to believe that we are here right now in this building for something more than that. And for as much as I'm excited about Walden Community Church and excited about all of our ministries, our growth, our outreach, I know that God has even more in store for us. I know that God is a worker. He is a creator. God gave us one day to rest, right? But the other six days, we're out there. We're, he expects us to be working. He expects us to be ministering. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus writes a letter to the church. It's a church in Laodicea, which is a Roman province of Asia. And listen to what Jesus says. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. There is a lot of scorching words in there. Pitiful, poor, blind, naked. Jesus said all of those words at a church. And notice he says also to them, your temperature is, it's so blasé, it's so tepid that it just makes me want to puke. Jesus says your passion is lukewarm. You're, you're not on fire for the kingdom, but you're not exactly frigid either. You're like soda that's been left on the counter overnight and you're flat and you're flavorless. And I think the scariest thing about this passage is how much some of us might say, ah, but yeah, I kind of identify with that. We, we hear that and the first thing we ask ourselves is, is that me? Am I lukewarm? And do I know it? And am I doing absolutely nothing about it? Because none of those words are good, right? None of those are good words. I can't spin those verses around to make them hopeful or positive. Jesus tells the church, you are, right? You are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. And if that's not how you would describe a bride at a wedding, is it? So you can't use these words to describe a church because the church is the bride of Christ. Th those words don't describe a faithful Christian. We, we never read in the Bible the, the testimony of any Christian that says, I once was blind and I'm still blind. Right? No, of course not. Jesus said this church is missing the point. And he said something about it. And it wasn't the first time that he said those words. If you look back at John chapter 2, it says, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at the tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all of the them out of the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. 
He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. I think sometimes people see indifference and inadequacy in the church and their first impulse is to do nothing. And what happens is no action at all leads to complacency. And it's comfort. And then finally, you just accept it. Economist and philosopher Edmund Burke, he said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Tell me something. Does, he, does Jesus strike you as the kind of person who would be worried about outward appearances? Or, or that he would say, you know what, I don't, I don't want to cause a scene. When he flipped the tables, do you think he was worried in that moment, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. What was more important to him? He, he wasn't going to just wait for all of this to blow over. Maybe, you know what, maybe they'll figure it out and they'll just change on their own. No. The Bible says that zeal for his father's house consumed him. Jesus looked at the church and he said, this is not how it's supposed to be. Y'all have missed it. You've missed the point. You know, I remember when I was young and I would sit out in the pews and I would look at pastors and I used to think about what godly people they might be and how holy they must be. And I thought, you know what, it, it'd probably be so amazing to be a pastor and to work for God as a living. And now, my biggest fear is that you would look at me like that and that you would think those same things about me. Because I ask myself the question all the time, am I for real? Do, do I really want God's will for my life? Or, or am I lukewarm sometimes? Do I just go with the flow because it's easy? Perhaps, maybe it's because we live in such an ungodly world that even when we see a mustard seed of faith, you know, and we see just a little bit of godliness in our leaders, in comparison to the rest of the world, it looks holy. But I worship, I worship a big God, so I don't want to be content with just a little. This is God's kingdom we're talking about. This is God's church we're talking about. He charges us to go and make disciples. He charges us to go and love the world, to be his representatives. Last week we said that when the world looks at the church, they're supposed to see God. They are supposed to be a light on a hill for the world to see. So we should never be content with complacency. So what should we do? That's a good question. What should we do? This is where the pastor steps in and he's got some alliteration, right? He's got three steps, three points, three bullets. Oh, I, you know, it's work harder, pray more, do more. That's good, right? Pray harder, work harder, do more. That's what the answer has to be. I should get back to being on fire for God. But watch what happens when I go back to that same letter that Jesus writes to the, to the Laodicean church. He says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. What does Jesus say to the lukewarm church? Does he say, work harder? Does he say, pray harder? Does he say, do more? Does he say, read your Bible every single day? Does he say, sing louder in church? Jesus simply says, I'm outside. I'm at the door. So what's the answer? Let him in, right? Let Jesus in. And then what happens next? Jesus says, what happens next is I come in and we have a meal together. We have an intimate relationship. You and I, we eat together. This is what it means to be in love with your creator. A church 
or, or your own individual life, okay? What, what happens is we end up doing it our own way for so long, we do it by our own strength and our own will, and we are happy, typically, to keep Jesus on the other side of the door. And as long as Jesus is out there, he won't challenge what we are doing in here. Our tables will be upright. <laughs> and we can go about business as normal. But it's when you invite Jesus in and you share your life with Jesus, that falling in love moment, Jesus begins to shape what you do. That is how the church should live. That's how the church should love. Because you do crazy things when you're in love, right? You drive for miles to see them. You give them money. You buy them gifts. You do them favors. And you're happy to do it. You love to do it. You're crazy to do it. And all of this service that you do for the one you love, it doesn't feel like work. It's not work. Because you're thinking in your own mind, I, I would do anything for them. That's what ministry looks like. That's what being a minister looks like. In our relationship with God, if it's just work and more work and obligation and, oh my gosh, there's another thing I have to do for the church, there's another meeting, there's another assignment, then are you really in love with God? Or are you just working so that you can keep the doors open? Are you just working so that you can keep the bills paid? Jesus never says, I want a busy church. He doesn't say that. He said he wants a church with temperature, right? Listen to these beautiful words from Jesus. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has plenty of room. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Now, you know I love this passage, right? I read this passage a lot in church because this is wedding language. Jesus is the groom and he says, honey, I love you. I love you and I'm going back. I'm going back to my dad's house and it's, it's the place where I grew up as a boy and I'm gonna work and I'm gonna put an addition onto that house. I'm gonna make a place, not just for you, but also a place for me and we're gonna live there together forever. What's that gonna look like? You ever wonder? You ever wonder what heaven will look like? That place that Jesus is building for you? Revelation 3.21 says, to those who are victorious, that's you. That's the church, the church that overcomes. When you get past all of this, all of this, all of this, when you get past over this, you are the one who overcomes. I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. You know what fires me up? You know what makes me look forward to the finish line? You know what makes a great locker room encouraging talk? That verse. Jesus says, if we overcome, that means if we get past, the complacency, if we just heat up our temperature, if we invite Jesus in and we begin to have that relationship, at the end of it all, we get to sit on the throne with God. Jesus says to the church, if you overcome, you get to sit with me on that throne. And then in Revelation 4, Jesus shows us the throne room. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And at once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne room in heaven with something sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and circled the throne. Surrounding the throne, there were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came crashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. 
Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second one was like an ox, the third had the face of a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. And day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures gave glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sit on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before him and say, You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The Bible says, In that throne room, There are 24 elders and they gather at the foot of the throne. They remove their crowns and they worship God. But also in that throne room, there are these hideous monsters that sit at the foot of the throne of God. Beasts, dragons from mythology. And they say, don't even look at us because we're not the one who is holy. And the next chapter says, Revelation 5, Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. You ever wondered what heaven looked like? What, what are all those things that we see? Lightning, thunder, fire, monsters, millions of angels, all worshiping God. And then God says to the church, you can sit up here with me. (laughs) Imagine what that would feel like to sit on the throne with God. The Bible says if we overcome, if we are victorious, you get to sit with the love of your life. Jesus stands at the door and says, Will you be my bride? Will you be my daughter? Will you be my son? How do you respond to that invitation? Okay, I guess so. Right? What a flavorless answer. Jesus does not want a a casual response here. If you got down on one knee and you proposed to to the love of your life, you don't want them to respond back with, I guess. I mean, you're the best person to ask me so far. What are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with the rest of your life? What is the desire of your life? Because there's probably a thousand different answers, but are any of them that You want to work on your relationship with God so that one day you can sit on the throne. As a friend of God, as the bride of Christ, the church needs to invite Jesus in and eat with him. Jesus called the work that we have left to do, he called that the kingdom of God. His parables describe how the kingdom of God grows, how it spreads. He talks about how the kingdom of God is a movement. In one parable, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had and bought it. Notice that both of these people, they sell everything they have to obtain one thing. That one thing is the kingdom of God. Are you in love with the kingdom of God that much? Does God make you so happy just to be his child that you would do anything? That's how it should be. That's the model that we have from Christ. Our whole lives should be different than everybody else's. People should look at us, look at our church and say, what is going on with those people? First Peter 2 says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. All of that, that's Exodus language. Peter's using Exodus language. Peter says, every believer is a priest. Now at Walden Church, we communicate that truth through four words. Every member, a minister. Every member, a minister. But what does that mean? Does, doesn't the church already have a, a minister? How can, every, how can every member be a minister? Well, let's show you an example from the book of Acts. Look at how the early church began. When the apostle Stephen was killed for his testimony, the Bible says in Acts chapter 8, that day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all, that's the entire church, all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. The story continues in verse 4. Now those who were scattered went from place to place proclaiming the word. Notice that the Bible says that everyone was doing ministry. Everyone except the apostles <laughs> were scattered throughout the country of Judea and Samaria. That's not what you'd expect. I mean, if it were a call of any New Testament church to have trained clergy, it would be the apostles, right? They would be, they would be that. These are, the, these are the guys who had spent their lives being discipled by Jesus, and yet they're the ones who stay behind. And what is this scattered church doing? Going from place to place proclaiming the word. Remember, they're just, they're just common people. They're just lay people like you and me. Some of these people who went from place to place were Paul and Silas. You remember Paul and Silas, they went to a place called Thessalonica and they stayed with another Christian man named Jason. And when the local opposition learned that Paul and Silas were in town, they sent a lynch mob to get them. Why? Look at what it says in Acts 17.6. And when they could not find them, Paul and Silas, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. What a reputation the church had. Can you imagine? In a world without TV, internet, media, cell phones, what the church is doing had reached the ears of this town, and they said, these are the people that we have heard so much about. And what are they accused of doing? Upsetting the balance of the world. Unbelievable. I mean, forget just turning tables over. Now, the church is accused of turning the world over right? This is how Jesus Christ established and built his church for over 300 years. Ordinary people like you and me being scattered and proclaiming the word. That's how the early church functioned. And yes, of course, there were shepherds back then, men and women who led the church, who taught, but ministry was primarily done by every person working together. Ephesians 4 describes some of the roles the people had. Now these are the gifts Christ gave the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. What does that mean? Well, it means in every church there are apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Not one, plural, many, right? Not one minister, many ministers. It's only when Christianity became the official state religion of the empire that everyone was forced, basically, to be Christian. And suddenly, laity, the lay people, stopped doing ministry, and they turned it over to paid professionals. The father of the Protestant movement, Martin Luther, he spent his lifetime fighting for what he called the priesthood of all believers. He wrote once that his dream was, we shall recover that joyful liberty in which we all understand that we are all equal in every right, and shall shake off the yoke of tyranny and know that he who is a Christian has Christ, and he who has Christ has all things that are Christ and can do all things. So I want to look at one more church letter. 
This is Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And at the end of chapter four, I believe, Paul has a healthy biblical understanding of what the phrase, every member a minister, looks like. Ephesians 4 says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so the body of Christ may be built up. Ta-da! It's right there. Every member is a minister so that the body of Christ is built up. Right? Those two words, so that, so that, shows that there is purpose behind ministry, so that the body is built up. In 2005, a leadership conference conducted a survey of the pastors and discovered that more, the more members who serve a church, the more that church grows. The more members who serve a church, the more members give. Why do you think that is? Well, because when you actually get in the game, you care more, right? You want to succeed more. You're not just interested, now you're invested. People serve in a ministry with the gifts that God has given them, and spiritual gifts are not toys that we play with, and they're not treasures that we hide. They are tools that God gives us to build his church so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith. When every member is a minister, we experience unity. The Greek word reach refers to travelers who arrive at their final destination. A couple weeks ago, we looked at Jesus' prayer for the church before he goes to the cross. And what is the thing he prays for? What does he pray for you and me? Unity, right? He says, make them one, Father, as we are one. Unity is why we put on the team jersey, right? It's why we all walk out onto the field together. Disunity is where we all sit on the sidelines and we gossip and we backstab or we criticize and we say, well, I could do it better. I can't believe they're not running that play. Don't they know how to play this game? I can't believe they didn't ask me to help. I can't believe I didn't get a pat on the back. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. When every member is a minister, we will have a deepened relationship with Christ. You know, when Joanna and I were youth pastors, kids would always come back from summer camp and they were excited. You know, next week we're going to have our Youth Sunday and you're going to get to hear all about summer camp and you're going to get to hear all about the kids going off to summer camp. You're going to hear some testimonies. It's going to be a great Sunday morning. I want to encourage you to come. Remember, it's a combined service at 1030. There's going to be a fish fry afterwards. So all the money that they raise for that will go in support of the, the youth group. So please come for that. But I remember when we were youth pastors, our kids would come back from summer camp and they'd, they would be hot, right? They'd be on fire. And they would, they would not want to go back to complacency and normalcy again. They didn't want to go back to that. They didn't want to come down off that, that camp escalation. And they would ask Joanna and I, they would ask us, how do I keep this fire burning? What's the next thing I need to do? And we would always give them the same answer. Serve. You can serve this youth group or you can serve this church. It doesn't matter that you're a youth. You can go and serve the church. You can join the church as a youth. Serve. Serve is the steroids of Christian maturity. If last week we said that community will begin when people start to join a church and they commit themselves to other committed people, then maturity begins when you start to serve those people. Even Jesus said, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That Christian walk we talked about last week, being a disciple, it's about sacrifice. It's about giving your life, right? Picking up your cross and following Jesus. You give your life for someone else, just like he gave his life for you. 
Verse 13 says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, that we will no longer be infants. So when every member is a minister, we will have a mature relationship. I recall a story uh, that my pastor told me once. There was a little girl who had been trying to learn to tie her own shoes for months until one day she tied her shoelace bow and her parents erupted with praise and applause and the little girl started to cry. And the parents said, what's wrong? Why are you crying? And the little girl wiped away a tear and she said, now I will have to tie my own shoes every day. Mature membership is the passing of knowledge and love from one generation to the next. It happens through mentoring. It happens through discipling. The church matures as we give our time and talents and treasures. Every member, a minister, is learning how to give back what you've been given. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. When every member is a minister, we will experience spiritual stability. I said that in the early church, it was the members who did the work. And that, that's how it was. From the early church all the way until Constantine. After that, the church appointed bishops and, and elders and priests. And slowly, over time, all the work shifted over to the, the paid employees, right? And then the attendees just came in and sat in rows. And it wasn't until Protestant leaders like Zwingli and Martin Luther, they argued for a different role and that the role of the pastor and the role of the shepherd. In fact, it's not even until the 18th century that you even see the word pastor come into use. So here's my point. We put a lot of responsibility on our nation's pastors. In fact, so much so that when the church loses a pastor, nobody even wants to go to that church anymore. Why is that? Well, it's like when you take a column out of your house. You just removed a support beam and there was a lot riding on that one person. And when you remove them, well, well a lot of stuff comes crashing down. Jesus didn't want his church to be built like that. That's not a healthy church. That's not a healthy ministry. Because when every member is a minister, when we all chip in, when we all roll up our sleeves, then we experience stability. We experience grounding, bedrock, firmness. The church should not rise or fall on one person. And it shouldn't rise or it shouldn't succeed or fail on the back of one person. Verse 15 says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every support, ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. When every member is a minister, we will be joined in love. Church is always making progress towards health, towards love, and when it's filled with people who serve, and when pastors, you, ministers, right? When, when, when I, as a pastor, help you exercise your gifts, just like we said last week, love has to be the root of all of it, right? We serve because we love God. We serve because we love people. The church grows and matures. We invite Jesus in and he eats with us. This week, when I was preparing for my sermon, I came across a quote from another pastor. So I'm gonna share it with you as we close right now. God gave me a gift, not for me, but for you. And God gave you a gift, not for you, but for me. And if you don't use your gift, you are depriving me. And if I don't use my gift, I am robbing you. Let's pray. 
Lord God, we thank you that we have these writings, that we have these teachings in the Bible, and we ask that we would not just read them with our ears, but that we would process this information and that we would do your work. That there is still work left for the church to do. Help us to be on fire for you. Help us to not be afraid to invite you in, to have an intimate relationship with you as you direct us, as you impart your will on us. Lord, may your kingdom and your kingdom work excite us. May we seek your will and do your will here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, may this church and churches everywhere be your beautiful bride. May we continue to show the world what the church can do by the power of your love. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we get to be your sons and daughters and that one day we too will sit on the throne in heaven with you. May your church continue the work that you have given us to do. We pray that every member in every church be a minister, that they are scattered and proclaiming the word. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks for coming out and hanging out with us. Like I said, next week is Youth Sunday. Our youth is going to be up here on in church. They're going to talk to you about all the different things that they're doing. We're so excited about that. And did you know our youth group continues on through the summer? That's right. We go on through the summer. We don't take a break. Okay, we don't, we don't quit. We, we keep going. Every Wednesday, you can send your sixth grader through high schooler over to Walden Community Church. You can send them over on the bike, the skateboard, their scooter. They can walk over. They can ride a horse over. Well, they probably can't. I don't, I don't have a horse stall. But anyway, just send them, send them over. If you send them at six, we will feed them. That's right. We will feed them dinner and we'll send them home to you in about an hour and a half. We're guaranteed to have a loving, welcoming environment for them. Uh, We love your kids and we want to spend the summer with them. Thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next week.